every once in a while, usually once per decade or so, there is one big change that happens in tech that affects everything in tech. And not just that, but it also affects everything in our everyday lives. Like a good example of that would be the introduction of the very first iPhone back in 2007, which literally changed how future phones looked and how future phones functioned to this very day. Samsung's flexible display technology from 2011 allowed us to have the foldable phones that we have today, with many more to come in the near future. Tesla's autopilot has redefined and will continue to redefine the car industry. And now there is another big change just around the corner. And it's all about the processor. So get ready for a bit of a more technical video. Get those snacks ready and enjoy. Okay, so up until 2006, Apple Macs were using PowerPC processors. PowerPCs were a type of reduced instruction set architecture processors, which were created in 1991 by, ironically, Apple, IBM, and Motorola, also known as the AIM Allegiance. Or Alliance? Allegiance? Which one is it? Let me know in the comments. But anyways, the whole idea behind PowerPC processors was to develop some very affordable processors for the average consumer, rather than those high-end uh, and expensive processors developed for business users. Um, and these processors would not only be very powerful for the average user, but would also allow programmers to very quickly and easily write code for them. And it was all good. From 1994 up until 2006, Apple has only been using PowerPC processors. But in 2005, at WWDC, Steve Jobs went on stage to make a big announcement. He announced that Apple will be moving away from PowerPC processors to Intel processors. And so it's time for a third transition, and yes, it's true. <laughs> we are going to begin the transition from the PowerPC to Intel processors. And the main reason for this was the performance per watt. So Steve said that PowerPC processors gave Macs around 15 units of performance per each watt, whereas Intel processors were giving them 70 units of performance per watt. So yeah, almost five times as much. And this is why Apple switched from PowerPC to Intel processors, just because Intel's chips were more powerful while also consuming less energy, meaning that their machines could be thinner and more portable, which was very important back then when, you know, devices were not as thin and not as portable as they are now. Now, switching to a new processor, especially when uh, this new processor has a very different architecture, is extremely, extremely difficult. Um, and PowerPC and Intel were both based on a completely different architecture. So PowerPC's CPUs, they were based on the Power Instruction Set Architecture, or Power ISA, whereas Intel CPUs were based on the x86-64 architecture, which is still being used, obviously, today. What this means was that they were speaking in completely different languages. And what this meant was not just that every single new program had to be rewritten from scratch, but macOS itself was not capable of running on Intel processors at all. Unless, of course, they had a translator. And that translator was called Rosetta. You know, just like the stone that helped us a ton in translating ancient Egyptian, um, as the top half of it was actually written in ancient Egyptian, while the bottom half was written in ancient Greek. Fun fact. We've got an awesome technology called Rosetta that we're going to be shipping with these new machines. Anyways, what Rosetta did was that it translated PowerPC instructions into x86-64 instructions, which meant that most, not all, but most programs that were developed for the PowerPC platform could actually run on the Intel-based Macs without a need to be fully, fully rewritten. Now, the translation just wasn't perfect, just like, you know, when you're translating between two different languages, some expressions just won't translate that well. So while PowerPC apps could indeed run on Intel Macs, native apps that were designed for Intel Macs first, they would always run better. But that transition actually went very smoothly, and fast forward to 14 years into the future, and hello, we're in 2020 now, uh, and up until this point, Apple has kept on using Intel processors in all of their Macs since. However, 14 years later, Apple is now switching again from Intel to Apple's own series of processors this time. And this change will be even bigger than the last one. When we make bold changes, it's for one simple yet powerful reason. So we can make much better products. 
When we look ahead, we envision some amazing new products and transitioning to our own custom silicon is what will enable us to bring them to life. Okay, but why? Why switch? Isn't Intel the market leader when it comes to CPUs? Well, it is, at least in terms of the number of sales. Um, but they've actually been having some serious issues in the past few years. You see, the way a CPU works is that they have these tiny transistors that can pass electrical current through them, uh, which the CPU can then read as ones and zeros. Modern CPUs have billions of transistors, and the smaller and thinner they are, the faster they can pass through the current, and the faster the CPU actually is. It's like driving a car from New York to LA to deliver a package versus driving the same car from your house to your neighbor to deliver the same package. Obviously, the package will get to your neighbor's house much faster as the distance is smaller, and CPUs work in the same way. And the size at which the transistors inside the processor are measured at is just in a few nanometers. Now, Intel has been using a 14 nanometer process for quite some time now, and just to give you an idea of how uh, thin those transistors are, a human hair is around 90,000 nanometers in thickness. Uh, so that's absolutely nuts. A single strand of human DNA, for example, is 2.5 nanometers. And Intel has been manufacturing transistors at 14 nanometers, which is pretty incredible. But Intel has been releasing 14 nanometer CPUs since 2014 six years ago. So they've been trying to switch to 10 nanometers, the next step in the manufacturing process ever since. And they've only been able to do it in 2019, last year. Apple, on the other hand, they have switched to 10 nanometers back in 2017, two years ahead of Intel. And not only that, but Apple has since switched to seven nanometers in 2018, would have switched to five nanometers this year in 2020 with the upcoming Apple A14 processors. So Apple is already three generations ahead of Intel when it comes to the manufacturing process. Well, TSMC is, which is basically the manufacturer, the actual manufacturer for Apple's CPUs. Not only that, but AMD is also manufacturing on a seven nanometer process now, being two generations ahead of Intel themselves as well. Intel has launched nanometers in 2019, but even now, in 2020, only the mobile CPUs come with it, and only the Y series and the U series. So desktop processors and high-end laptop processors, such as the H series that you would find on a 16-inch MacBook Pro, for example, those are still based on the 14 nanometer process from uh, six years ago. I mean, it's obviously a refined process, but still, it is still that 14 nanometer process. Uh, manufacturing process. And even if you take a look at the 10 nanometer Y and U series of processors, uh, not even all the models are based on 10 nanometers. Some are still 14 nanometer CPUs. It's so horribly confusing. Like the whole point of Intel's 10 generation processors was to finally switch to 10 nanometers. And they've only done it on like 20% of their 10th generation processors. The rest are still 14 nanometers. And the processors now outperform Intel quite substantially, and they even do it at a lower price. Not only that, but Apple has improved their processors so much that even the 2018, not the 2020, the 2018 iPad Pro still outperforms most laptop processors from Intel. <laughs> Um, with the iPad Pro having a significantly better performance than a 2020 baseline 13-inch MacBook Pro and even a higher performance than the higher-end model that comes with a 10-generation processor. And not only is the iPad Pro way more powerful, but it is also significantly thinner than a laptop. And it doesn't even have a fan in it. So it is all passively cooled, whereas all of these laptops, they need to have gigantic cooling systems. So these are the two main reasons why Apple wants to move away from Intel. They want better performance, and they also want that performance at a lower power consumption than uh, what an Intel processor can currently offer. Which means that they can actually make their devices much more portable with also a significantly better battery life. Like imagine having an iMac that's as thin as an iPad Pro, or a MacBook Pro that lasts for 20 hours on a single charge, or even way more than that. But you see, there is one more reason why Apple wants to switch to a different processor this time. So unlike 2015, when uh, they were just looking for better performance at a lower power consumption, now in 2020, Apple has the iPhone and the iPad, none of which they had back in 2005. Not only that, but those devices also run on Apple's own processors, which means that Apple can now unify their entire line of devices and have any app run on the iPhone 
and on the iPad as well as on the Mac natively with zero changes in the code required. And yes, this means that you'll be able to run any iPhone app directly on your Mac. So apps such as Instagram, Facebook, uh, Messenger, WhatsApp, whatever, anything that you want, you'll be able to run on the Mac. And not only that, but it also works the other way around. So Mac apps will also be runnable on the iPhone and the iPad, even apps such as Final Cut Pro 10 and Logic Pro 10. In fact, Apple even showed Final Cut Pro 10 running on a Mac mini. But this was not a regular Mac Mini. This was a Mac Mini with an Apple A12Z processor. So the same processor as in the iPad Pro 2020. And while yes, it did have 16 gigabytes of RAM versus 6 gigabytes of RAM on the iPad, and that CPU was likely cooled as well, it could actually play three streams of 4K ProRes with effects at the same time without dropping any frames at all. Now, a 16-inch Mac Pro can run around 11 streams of 4K ProRes, which is quite a bit more. Also, this would be ProRes RAW, not just standard ProRes. Uh, but keep in mind that the A12Z, which Apple used in the demo, is just a tablet processor. So Apple already mentioned that they are working on more powerful variants of their own processors, just different models, to be used in Macs, which Apple hasn't shown any of yet. However, they did show us this graph that compared their processors to the current devices that Apple is offering. And while Apple's range is quite big, uh, we can indeed tell that they are developing laptop processors that are just on par with Intel's lowest end desktop processors, but at the same time having lower power consumption than Intel's current laptop processors. So what this means is that a 12-inch MacBook or even a MacBook Air, they could have something like a 20-hour battery life while also having more performance than an iMac, a base iMac, which is pretty nuts. Now, if we take a look at the upper part of this graph, we can see that Apple's even aiming to make some, uh, some processors better than any desktop processors that Intel makes, while also having just a tiny bit more power consumption than a current laptop processor. Now, these are very bold claims, but I do believe that they can honestly pull this off. Uh, especially if we take a look at what Apple has already achieved with the iPad Pro alone. Okay, so now that we've covered the why, what about the how? So macOS Big Sur is coming out later this year, and this will be the very first macOS that has been developed with both x86-64 architecture support and ARM architecture support, ARM being what Apple's using for their own processors. And Apple will actually be using the exact same Rosetta tool that they've used back in 2006 to switch from PowerPC to Intel. Now, this is called obviously Rosetta 2, so the second generation, and it will translate x86-64 code into ARM code. Yeah, so what this means is that you'll still be able to run all of your Intel software on future ARM Macs, which is pretty cool albeit native apps will still run much better on just the ARM processors. So Final Cut Pro 10 was a good example of that, and Apple also showed us Photoshop as well as Lightroom running natively on uh, their own processors, and they were both running extremely, extremely smooth. And Lightroom was also able to open up a massive library of raw photos without any lag or slowdown whatsoever, which is pretty impressive. Like on my Mac, for example, I always get the beach ball and some lag here and there. And you know, I never get 60 frames per second ever in Photoshop or Lightroom. I'm probably getting like 20. Uh, and that's even on the 16 inch 2019 uh, i9 eight core. Yeah, so that's crazy. Okay, so now you're probably wondering when, when is this transition going to happen and how would you be impacted? Well, Apple has said that this transition would take two years, meaning that by the end of 2022, we should have an Apple processor in every single Mac that Apple sells, from the MacBook Air all the way up to the Mac Pro, which is pretty nuts. Now, ARM processors, they've never been designed for sustained workloads, which is something that a lot of people, you know, mention whenever I'm talking about performance, uh, sustained performance on ARM processors. Uh, and, you know, while this has been true, it actually has been debunked because apparently The Verge reports that Japan has actually developed a supercomputer using ARM processors, and it turns out that this supercomputer is the fastest computer in the entire world, while also being 2.8 times faster than the previous most powerful supercomputer <laughs> in the world. So, yeah, ARM is definitely looking very promising. Now, Intel-based Macs will still be supported for a number of years, but if you plan on getting a Mac anytime soon, I would highly, highly advise you to just wait until the end of the year when Apple will be releasing their first Mac with an Apple processor. Ming-Chi reports that 
it will even be a brand new 13 inch MacBook Pro. Uh, and yeah, that sounds pretty cool. So it won't be a 12 inch MacBook according to Ming Jiquo, uh, but instead it will be a 13 inch MacBook Pro, maybe a 14 inch with a larger display, but that would be the first apparently with an ARM processor. And I'm really, really excited for that. Okay, so now I just wanna to touch a bit on macOS Big Sur. So <laughs> aside from this having the weirdest name that I've seen, I haven't heard of Big Sur before. I have heard of Big Slur. So uh, yeah, I messed it up in, in some tweets. But anyways, this is this is really the biggest software update since macOS Yosemite, which changed up the uh, design significantly from the previous design language that macOS Mavericks used. So Big Sur is a, uh, yeah, it's a pretty big update, not just in terms of design, but it also adds a ton of elements from the iPhone and the iPad onto macOS. So we even get things such as a control center and <laughs> the exact same iOS system toggles, which is very strange. Like, you know, I really do like this design, but it kind of looks like it was made for touch input first because, uh, you know, it, ac it actually was. The iOS UI was made for touch input rather than mouse input, so the fact that Apple's adding the exact same design language and the same UI uh, makes me think that Apple maybe wants to release a touchscreen Mac in the not too distant future. And that would be amazing. I really hope that that's the case. Hopefully the next MacBook Pro would be would have touchscreen support. That would be awesome. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Also, I don't know if you noticed, but Apple is now using a very rounded uh, design language for the corners and everything which, you know, they've also using that on, they've done that on the iPhone and the iPad, which makes me think that maybe the next Macs would actually have a curved display, or at least the corners will be rounded and stuff squared off. So that'll be a, yeah, that'll be a nice touch. The startup sound is back, which is quite interesting to see. And alongside a ton of design elements from iOS, such as the notification panel, the indicator that shows the amount of battery that you have left uh, in hours, so that's now back. Yeah, so that's essentially what I've done. And I've also cleaned up the UI quite significantly. Now, I do have two main concerns regarding the Big Sur's design. Uh, the first one would be the UI elements, which I've just talked about before, the fact that they seem as if they were designed for a touch input rather than mouse. And the second concern, <laughs> the icons. Um, so Apple's calling this a unified design, but I mean, take a look at these icons and tell me that they look like that on iOS as well, because because they don't. So the macOS ones, they have this very strange shadow, which is not on the outside, but on the inside. Like, really? Wh why? This is so strange. Like, you don't have this on iOS. And they just look like all these icons were designed by different people. Like, take a look at the Mac Reminders icon, which has no shadow at all. And now take a look at the Messages icon, which does have a shadow. So how many people, <laughs> I think they, they just picked random people to design each icon. I think that's that's how they did it. They just had like a big hat with just labels and they just, yeah. Yeah, hopefully hopefully this gets fixed uh, by October when Mac OS Big Sur is said to be released to the public, hopefully. But anyways, overall, I'm definitely looking forward to the future of the Mac. Um, and this transition will shape the entire tech industry, forcing more companies to innovate in the mobile CPU space, and of course, forcing Intel to do something about their CPU offering, because at, you know, at a moment, AMD's ahead, and it seems like Apple is now ahead as well. So yeah, I wanted to comment your thoughts on everything that I talked about in this video, and if you want to support the channel and also get these really cool badges next to your name in the comment section, which everyone can see, definitely do consider becoming a member by tapping on the join button down below. So yeah, thank you for watching. Definitely excited for the future of the Mac. I'm Daniel, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Zenoftech, signing out. Cheers.